Thank you for that very warm welcome. And uh, thank you to the organisers for, for the invitation to be here. Uh, and I want to say congratulations to the Acona Fellows. Uh, it's been wonderful to, to have the opportunity to meet you all. Uh, dear friends, uh, colleagues, uh, it is, uh, I can think of no better place to be discussing arms control negotiations than here in Reykjavik, the city where in 1986 the leaders of the two largest nuclear armed states came unexpectedly close to agreeing to eliminate their nuclear forces completely. It is perhaps the closest the world has ever come to such an agreement. In nuclear policy, we often speak of near misses. This was the site of a near breakthrough. What a different world we might live in today had the Reykjavik summit been more successful. In the current international security environment, an agreement to eliminate or just to make deep cuts in the Russian and US nuclear stockpiles seems quite unthinkable. But bold and ambitious plans of the kind briefly contemplated by the US and Soviet leaders 38 years ago are urgently needed. The taboo against the use of nuclear weapons is being eroded and the treaty architecture for arms control and disarmament is in desperate need of reinforcement. Particularly since Russia's invasion of Ukraine two years ago, tensions among nuclear armed states are frighteningly high and arms control agreements have almost completely broken down. All around the world, voices for peace are being drowned out by the drumbeats of war. Today, the doomsday clock of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, a metaphorical representation of our proximity to total destruction, is set at just 90 seconds to midnight. This should be a wake-up call to all governments. The perilous state of the world is why the work of the Arms Control Negotiation Academy is so crucial. You are learning the lessons of history so that mistakes are not repeated and opportunities like those that presented themselves here in Reykjavik are not squandered. You are deepening your understanding of the necessity of dialogue and diplomacy, of multilateralism and the international rule of law for our collective security and ultimately our survival. It is my great pleasure to be here among new friends who share the goal of a nuclear weapon free world and I wish you well as you uh, carry on your um, careers in this field. The title of my address today is Modern Diplomacy and the Future of the Nuclear Order. And I'll focus on the main multilateral instruments for nuclear disarmament, the 1968 uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty and the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And I'll later touch on deterrence since that has been a, a key topic of conversation today. Uh, so back to the two uh, treaties. Uh, these are landmark treaties that are complementary and mutually reinforcing, as the Sec UN Secretary General and many others have emphasised. Indeed, the negotiators of the TPNW took great care to ensure that the new treaty would reinforce and in no way undermine the older treaty. Yet the nuclear armed states persist in their spurious claims that the TPNW is a threat to the NPT, perhaps because they see it as a threat to their indefinite retention of nuclear weapons. Since the TPNW was adopted seven years ago against the wishes of the nuclear armed states and without their involvement, they have actively challenged its legitimacy. But the TPNW is here to stay, having entered into force in 2021, and it is already having a meaningful impact it enjoys widespread support from governments and civil society. Indeed, soon a majority of the world's states will be counted as parties or signatories. Those who were most instrumental in negotiating the TPNW are also among the strongest supporters of the NPT. States such as Austria, Ireland and New Zealand. No one can seriously challenge their level of commitment to the NPT. In fact, Ireland was the very first state to sign the NPT in 1968 in recognition of its central role in that treaty's creation. But Ireland and many other states recognise the need for a new complementary instrument, instrument to advance the neglected role, um, goal of nuclear disarmament. Under Article 6 of the NPT, states' parties must pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race and to nuclear disarmament. 
The TPNW is one such effective measure as envisaged and required by the NPT. For decades, non-nuclear weapon states under the NPT have rightly criticised the nuclear weapon states for failing to fulfil their Article 6 obligations. Not only are they refusing to engage in multilateral negotiations for nuclear disarmament, but they are also actively enhancing and in some cases expanding their nuclear forces. Instead of laying out plans for the elimination of their nuclear weapons, they are expressing their intention to retain them for many decades to come. And the more that nuclear weapon states and their allies insist that nuclear weapons are essential for their security, the more other countries will want them. Their present activities can only be described as a new nuclear arms race and an encouragement of proliferation, entirely incompatible with the letter and spirit of the NPT. And these activi activities are indeed the principal threat facing the NPT today. Traditionally, the nuclear weapon states have been adept at keeping our focus on proliferation concerns and other issues, so as to distract from their own non-compliance on disarmament. For too long, they've treated the NPT as a licence to retain their nuclear weapons for as long as they wish. They refer to themselves as responsible nuclear weapon states, a contradiction in terms. As the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, there are no right hands for wrong weapons. The NPT quite clearly is a disarmament treaty. The requirements of Article 6 cannot simply be ignored. They are fundamental to the agreement. And the obligation to pursue and achieve nuclear disarmament applies regardless of the prevailing international security environment. It is not a conditional obligation, just as the non-proliferation obligations under the treaty are not conditional. Imagine if a non-nuclear weapon state were to argue that it is no longer bound by the requirement never to manufacture nuclear weapons because the security environment had become adverse. We would not tolerate it. And we should not tolerate the nuclear weapon states' continued failure to fulfil their NPT disarmament obligations and commitments. Moreover, it must be noted that the dire security environment at present is largely the result of the actions of the nuclear weapon states themselves, not just Russia, but all of them. They are creating the very conditions which, in their view, make it impossible for them to disarm. The TPNW was negotiated in 2017 because of the deep concern of the majority of the world's states at this parlous state of affairs. They recognised the need for stronger international standards and norms in the field of nuclear disarmament in order to reinforce the NPT. In their view, and ours, it was beyond time to put nuclear weapons on the same legal footing as other weapons of mass destruction, by prohibiting them comprehensively. No more double standards. The same rules should apply to all states. Two years before the TPNW negotiations commenced, 127 states endorsed an Austrian-initiated document known as the Humanitarian Pledge, committing them to cooperate in diplomatic efforts to fill the legal gap with respect to nuclear weapons. The pledge was based on the understanding that the prohibition of a particular type of weapon can facilitate progress towards its elimination. That had been the experience with respect to chemical and biological weapons, anti-personnel landmines and cluster munitions. Weapons that had been prohibited by treaties were increasingly seen as illegitimate, losing their political status and along with it the resources for their production. Furthermore, underpinning the decision by governments and civil society to pursue <coughs> the TPNW, was the belief that changing the rules regarding nuclear weapons would have a profound impact, even beyond those countries willing to join it at the outset. We had seen how the Mine Ban Treaty and Cluster Munition Convention had established powerful norms influencing the policies and practices of holdout countries. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty too had been instrumental in bringing an end to nuclear testing despite the refusal of several nuclear armed states to ratify it. The TPNW negotiators understood that new international norms could in time help compel nuclear armed states to change course. The negotiating conference was open to the participation of all UN member states and observer states. More than 130 participated. Unsurprisingly, the nuclear armed states and many of their allies chose not to participate given their strong support for nuclear weapons. 
Some held a protest of sorts out outside the General Assembly uh, on the uh, opening day of the negotiations, led by Nikki Haley, who was the new US ambassador to the UN at the time. But no state had the power to prevent the treaty's adoption. Too often in the world of multilateral diplomacy, particularly disarmament dis diplomacy, negotiations are derailed through procedural objections. The states that drove the TPNW process forward understood this very well and formulated rules of procedure that would maximise the chances of a successful outcome. The large number of states participating in the negotiations reflected the high priority that the international community attaches to this issue and represented the democratisation of the nuclear weapons debate. Whereas previously, any discussion about nuclear weapons was controlled primarily by those who have them, five of them being the permanent five of the Security Council. The large number of states participating in the TPNW negotiations was the result of a deliberate effort to engage smaller states that had previously been sidelined from disarmament debates. Some of the participating states had themselves experienced the devastating health and environmental consequences of nuclear testing by the colonial powers and therefore had very important and unique contributions to make to the debates. Representatives of survivor communities also took part, adding to the strong humanitarian focus of the negotiations and providing direct evidence of injury and illness from radiation across generations, as well as lasting damage to cultural practices and permanent displacement from their traditional homes. Preceding the negotiations, three major international intergovernmental conferences were held in Norway, Mexico and Austria to examine the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. These conferences provided a compelling evidence base for the negotiations. Having considered in detail the indiscriminate catastrophic harm that nuclear weapons inflict upon communities when used or tested, states understood the urgency of the task at hand. The testimonies of atomic bomb survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as nuclear test survivors from various parts of the world, helped establish a clear abolitionist agenda for the negotiations. The objective was not an arms control treaty, but an abolition treaty. Placing further limits on the use or deployment of nuclear weapons is a welcome goal in the short term, but it's not sufficient by itself. We wanted a comprehensive set of prohibitions coupled with a framework for elimination. Given the grave threat that nuclear weapons pose to humanity and the planet, this was the only appropriate and rational course of action. In addition to prohibiting nuclear weapons and requiring their elimination, the TPNW has novel provisions for assisting victims of the use and testing of nuclear weapons and for providing environmental remediation. In this respect, it is more than just a disarmament treaty. It is a human rights, a health and an environment treaty. It was clear from the discussions in Norway, Mexico and Austria that the terrible legacy from more than 2,000 nuclear test explosions around the world could no longer be ignored. Communities living downwind or downstream of former nuclear test sites were still suffering higher rates of cancers and other illnesses and radiation was continuing to poison their lands and waters. There was a humanitarian imperative to meet the needs of affected communities and to remediate contaminated environments. The TPNW negotiations were unique, not only for the greater participation of smaller states and affected communities, but also for the greater participation of scientists, academics, young people and women. Ambassador Elaine White Gomez of Costa Rica led the process and many women played prominent roles in national delegations and as part of civil society. The TPNW's preamble expresses a commitment to supporting and strengthening the effective participation of women in nuclear disarmament and acknowledges the gendered impacts of nuclear weapons, including as a result of ionising radiation. The TPNW is, one might say, the first feminist disarmament treaty. We are well aware of the tremendous challenges we face in realising the treaty's lofty aims. But as many of the state's parties have said, it is a beacon of hope in challenging times. It has helped solidify the international consensus that nuclear threats are inadmissible. 
It has brought humanitarian considerations and the fight for nuclear justice to the fore. It has encouraged hundreds of major cities around the world, including Rome, New York, Paris, to call for the elimination of nuclear weapons via the TPNW. It has prompted financial institutions to divest billions of dollars from the companies that manufacture nuclear weapons because they're now banned. But much more work is needed to increase the treaty's membership and popularise its norms. There is still a long struggle ahead of us, but having clear standards of behaviour codified in international law is an essential starting point, and that's what the TPNW provides. Friends, as this conference is being held in Iceland, I wanted to touch on the position of NATO with respect to nuclear weapons in general and the TPNW specifically. Since 2010, NATO has described itself as a nuclear alliance. It regularly asserts that so long as nuclear weapons exist in the world, it will remain such an alliance. It argues that nuclear weapons preserve peace, prevent coercion and deter aggression. But at the same time, it claims to be committed to the goal of a nuclear weapon free world. Three NATO members, the United States, the United Kingdom and France, possess nuclear weapons and five host US nuclear weapons on their territories as part of NATO nuclear sharing arrangements. Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands and Turkey. In 2017, just one NATO member, the Netherlands, participated in the TPNW negotiations. And it was the sole state to vote against the treaty's adoption, with 122 states in favour. Before the negotiations began, the United States circulated a document to all NATO members, strongly encouraging them to oppose the process and to refrain from participating. The only reason that the Netherlands ignored this appeal was that democracy got in the way. Its parliament instructed the executive to participate. It is a sorry state of affairs that individual NATO members apparently cannot choose for themselves whether to support and join this important United Nations Treaty. It makes no sense that a country like Iceland would oppose a global ban on nuclear weapons, and yet that is its national position. Clearly, there is a democratic deficit. Opinion polls here and in many other NATO states have shown overwhelming public support for the TPNW. But the Icelandic government has not acted. It continues to vote against an annual resolution in the UN General Assembly relating to the TPNW. Even if NATO, as an alliance, is unwilling to support the TPNW, it should at the very least allow its individual members to decide for themselves whether to join it. Nothing in NATO's founding document, the North Atlantic Treaty, would prevent this, and nothing in the TPNW would prevent a NATO member from joining either. Some NATO members, such as Belgium, Germany and Norway, have opted to observe TPNW meetings, which is a positive start, and more should engage in this way. But observing meetings is hardly good enough. Ultimately, they must subscribe to the treaty's norms and make a firm commitment against the worst weapons of mass destruction. There should be no sitting on the fence, given the potential civilization-ending consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. Many NATO members today argue that Russia's invasion of Ukraine means that nuclear disarmament is off the table. It should no longer be pursued. Well, I would argue that Russia's actions and its use of nuclear weapons to coerce and intimidate only underscores the urgent need for multilateral negotiations for a nuclear weapon-free world. It would be dangerous and wrong-headed for NATO members to conclude that the best response to Russia's nuclear threats is to more deeply entrench their own support for nuclear weapons. NATO states are quite right to condemn Russia's nuclear threats, as well as its recent deployment of nuclear weapons to Belarus, which is a deeply troubling development. But what moral authority do they have to do so? NATO states have long justified nuclear sharing arrangements for themselves. It's a matter of do as we say, not as we do, which can never be a solid foundation for international peace and security. Friends, as uh, Tong Zhao uh, also noted just now, I want to appeal to all of you to devote time to understanding the true horrifying reality of what nuclear weapons do to people and the environment. Too few people working in this field have properly grasped that reality. There seems to be a greater awareness about weapons yields 
and delivery platforms and strategic stability, then about burn and blast injuries, acute radiation sickness, birth defects, cancers and environmental degradation. Too few people working in this field know that scientists writing in the Nature Journal in 2022 confirmed that even a limited nuclear war would not only kill millions of people outright, but would also cause global climate disruption leading to agricultural collapse and the death by starvation of billions of people in a nuclear winter, something that Icelanders may relate to given the consequences of the Laki volcano eruption in 1783 which caused a semi-nuclear winter and the death of one in five Icelanders from starvation. Uh, at the time, Benjamin Franklin was wrote, writing about the constant fog over Europe and North America. With the release of the film Oppenheimer, a new generation is learning for the first time the story of the dawn of the nuclear age. They know many of the key players and the moral dilemmas that some of them faced. But how many of the viewers have given more than a moment's consideration to what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The film barely mentioned the atomic bombings. It is not unusual for harsh realities like this to be brushed over, especially when they do not suit a particular official narrative. But proper knowledge of these realities is essential to our work. The reality of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that there were playgrounds littered with the charred bodies of children, dozens of them. At schools close to the hypercentres, hundreds of students were incinerated in a flash. Those not reduced to ash and vapour often suffered whole body burns and blast injuries. Their eyes and internal organs burst out of their bodies. Their skin dangled off their limbs in long strips. Maggots infested their wounds. They suffered agonising deaths in the horrific aftermath of these atrocities. There was no possible humanitarian response because the communications, transport, and hospital infrastructure was destroyed and the emergency workers were dead or incapacitated. The insidious lingering effects of radiation continued to claim victims years and decades later. This must be our starting point, our motivation. In Japanese, there's a special term for the survivors of the atomic bombings, hibakusha. Those who are alive today were just children in 1945, children who experienced unspeakable suffering and loss. I urge you to take the time to listen to their harrowing testimonies. This is true realism. This is realism. And throughout your careers, whenever you are faced with difficult decisions, ask yourselves what they might think. The US atomic weapons dropped on Japan in 1945 that killed a quarter of a million people would be considered today as relatively small tactical nuclear weapons. Human beings have created a weapon that has the capacity to destroy all complex life on Earth. Nuclear weapon states say, well, they're only for deterrence. The problem with this, as noted by former Australian Foreign Minister and co-chair of the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, Gareth Evans, is that keeping nuclear stockpiles, even if you don't intend to use them except by way of retaliation, is not a risk-free enterprise. He argued that the deterrent utility of nuclear weapons is illusory and that the risk of retaining nuclear weapons outweighs any conceivable benefit from them. Nuclear deterrence, to be credible, is based on a nuclear armed state's readiness and willingness to indiscriminately kill millions of innocent people in complete violation of international law. Nobel Peace Laureate Joseph Rotblat, one of the early scientists working on nuclear weapons, uh, who quit the Manhattan Project and then campaigned against nuclear weapons, described nuclear deterrence as the ultimate form of terrorism. TPNW states have identified deterrence as an obstacle to disarmament. Deterrence relies on an assumption of 100% rationality and predictability by all actors, including one's enemies, 100% of the time. It assumes each party has full knowledge of the other's intentions. Those are some bold assumptions to make. The increasing use of AI in the military that's speeding up the warfare, decreasing time for nuclear decision making, adds to the uncertainty. And of course, some things cannot be deterred, like accidents, miscalculations, unhinged leaders, terrorist groups, cyber attacks and simple mistakes. There have been many accidents and nuclear near misses over the decades, 
and it's often been more to sheer dumb luck than to uh, deterrence that we are still here. Robert McNamara, who was US Defence Secretary during the Cuban Missile Crisis, said, at the end we lucked out. It was luck that prevented nuclear war. The role of luck in, in avoiding nuclear war to date was explained by Benoit Pelopidas and Alex Wellerstein in an article in 2020 in the Washington Post titled, The reason we haven't had nuclear disasters isn't careful planning, it's luck. They wrote, the agencies and organisations that manage nuclear stockpiles tend to rely on narratives of total control. They reassure us nuclear weapons have an excellent safety record, nuclear deterrence will prevent nuclear war from happening, and these large expenditures on warheads that could kill millions and millions are not only a good idea, but also necessary to preserve a world in which nuclear weapons won't be used. But the historical counterexamples undermine that message. The near-miss nuclear accidents that resulted in nuclear warheads coming close to detonation, not only in the United States, such as the Goldsboro accident over North Carolina, but also in foreign territory like the Palomares accident over Spain, the close calls where US and Soviet early warning systems failed and informed their users that a nuclear strike had begun, the moments of brinkmanship that led leaders of both nations to have to make decisions that could lead to the deaths of hundreds of millions of people based on incomplete or false information. This doesn't mean luck was the only factor or skilled professionals weren't involved in nuclear control or their efforts didn't matter, but the track record is far from perfect in the nations whose nuclear histories we know well. And it's probably not much better in the nations whose nuclear histories we don't. Betting on another half century with nuclear weapons but with no new nuclear explosions is betting our luck won't run out in the future simply because it hasn't run out yet. Uh, the current Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, said, luck is not a strategy. And his number one recommendation in the new agenda for peace is the elimination of nuclear weapons. Albert Einstein was once asked, what would be the weapons used in World War III? He said he didn't know but that the weapons in World War IV would be sticks and stones. I put the question to you, is it not grossly irresponsible to base the fate of humanity and the earth on a theory of deterrence that may well work until the day it doesn't? And when it fails, there will be no shelter to be had under a nuclear umbrella. This is dramatically set out in uh, Annie Jacobson's best-selling new book, Nuclear War, a scenario which, notwithstanding Guy Roberts's um, criticisms, is really well researched and describes in stark detail, minute by minute, what, what happens when deterrence fails. And it's going to be made into a film by uh, director Denis um, Villeneuve, who made the Dune movies. Uh, in research on nuclear risks commissioned by Austria, there is a scientific paper that estimates the current risk of nuclear weapons being used by the US or Russia arising from a mistaken belief that the other side has launched a nuclear weapon as being 1% per annum. Would you get on a plane if you knew it had a 1 in 100 chance of crashing? Any risk above zero is unacceptable when it comes to civilization ending weapons. On a risk assessment matrix, nuclear armed states and their allies may depict the risk of use of nuclear weapons as a low probability event. However, the undeniably catastrophic consequences of any use means it is still a high risk that needs to be managed. Ask the dinosaurs how a low probability event combined with the catastrophic consequences turned out for them. Of course, there was nothing the dinosaurs could have done to prevent an asteroid striking the Earth. But in this case, we do have a choice. We can choose to eliminate nuclear weapons and the existential risk they pose. Humans built nuclear weapons and humans can dismantle them. What is needed is leadership, like that that was shown here in Reykjavik in 1986. But this time we need to go further and eliminate nuclear weapons altogether and the TPNW does provide the pathway to their elimination. Indigenous peoples around the world have always understood the inter interconnectedness between people and nature, that we're not separate from nature but a part of it, that what we do to nature we do to ourselves. 
And that's why it's particularly tragic that Indigenous peoples in Australia, the Pacific and other places have been and continue to be the primary victims of the more than 2,000 nuclear weapons tests carried out by colonial powers around the world. We owe it to them and to the children of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to ensure they achieve long-awaited justice and that it never happens again. In his annual peace proposal to the United Nations in 2009, Japanese peacemaker Daisaku Ikeda said this, the real enemy is not nuclear weapons per se, nor is it the states that possess or develop them. The real enemy that we must confront is the ways of thinking that justify nuclear weapons, the readiness to annihilate others when they're seen as a threat or as a hindrance to the realisation of our objectives. We have the capacity to think differently. We have the capacity to choose dialogue over confrontation, diplomacy over militarisation and disarmament over proliferation. We have the capacity as human beings to create a new future that respects the earth and each other. Because while every species will be harmed in a nuclear war, only one species can stop it. And as Margot uh, Wallstrom said this morning, it's important to also prepare for peace. So what Oppenheimer started, we have the opportunity to end. I urge you all to play your part in this important mission. Thank you.